Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Welcome to the last session of day two of the 2024 Exploring for the Future program showcase. My name is Dr. Mario Bonardo, and I'm Director of Integrated Geological Mapping here at Geoscience Australia. I'm very excited to moderate this session that is very close to my heart, and that is entitled Maps of Australian Geology Like Never Before. And to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Nunawal and Embry people who have lived and shared culture in Canberra region for many thousands of years. And I pay my respect to the elders past and present. I also recognize our First Nations partners and traditional custodians of the land we have access through this program. And finally, I'd like to extend my warm welcome to all First Nations Australians joining us today. I would also like to thank all our collaborators for their valuable input throughout the program. The work we are showcasing this week does not only reflect individual expertise, but also the strength of partnership and teamwork. And this is this collective endeavor and shared vision that has made this program so successful. So thank you. Earlier today, we heard about individual data sets that we have used to characterize the physical properties of the Australian uh, tectonic plate from great depth up to the surface and near surface. If you missed the session, I invite you to visit the showcase webpage where you will have access to all the recordings as well as the links to the output we are releasing. So for this last session today, we will go beyond the characterization of the physical and chemical properties of the Australian continent, and we will look at how we map the geological units that control these properties. We have three talks for this afternoon, and we will start by characterizing the age and isotopic signature of these rocks. Then we will introduce the world's first layered continental geological map that was re released by Dr. Andrew Heap yesterday, and then we will finish by outlining our approach to constrain the depth to these units through a layered 3D geological modeling. After the talk, there will be a Q&A session where you will have the opportunity to ask questions of the presenters using the Q&A stream located at the top of your screen. So our first speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Jeff Fraser, who will talk about an isotopic atlas of Australia extra dimensions to national maps. So Jeff is a geologist and geochronologist with over 20 years experience at Geoscience Australia. 
He currently leads the geochronology and stratigraphy team in the mineral systems branch. So thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this final session of the day. In this presentation, I'll provide an overview of our work in developing and expanding a series of data sets of radiometric ages and isotopic traces at national scale, which we call an isotopic atlas of Australia. I hope you'll get a flavour for how those data sets add extra dimensions to national maps and models, particularly by adding a time dimension. And I'd like to thank the many people who have contributed to this work, both at GA and amongst our collaborators. If you've been participating in the earlier sessions of the EFTF showcase today, you'll have seen an exciting array of new national scale geoscience data sets, maps and models. As a quick reminder, these have included the OS Array Survey and the seismic velocity models that come from it, the OSLAMP Magnetotelluric Survey and the models of electrical conductivity through the deep levels of crust and mantle lithosphere, and the OS AEM surveys, again mapping electrical conductivity but in this case in the upper few hundred metres of the crust. And these new national geophysical coverages add to others that keep improving, such as the national gravity and magnetics coverages shown here. And we've also heard from Phil and Alex in the previous session about new chemical and mineralogical data sets and maps. Each of these data sets provides a different and complementary view of the physical and chemical composition of our continent. And although all these maps you've been seeing today are all mapping different aspects of our national geology, they all share something in common. They are all views of our geology in its current state. Of course, mapping the current state of the continent is an obvious and important thing to do, not least because we live on the continent in its current state, and we need to find and manage the mineral, energy and groundwater resources as they are today. However, we know that our continent and its natural resources did not just appear in their current configuration overnight. Our geology as we map it today is the product of several billion years of history, and the resources on which we depend were formed episodically through that history. The search for new resources can be made more effective and efficient by understanding the timing of the many processes that have punctuated our geological history, and by using that information to focus the search in places with the right geological ingredients and in rocks of the appropriate age. In this presentation, I'll provide an overview of our efforts to provide insights into this long and episodic history of Australian geology and its mineral resource development. We've been doing this along with our collaborators by building a series of national coverages of geological ages and time-sensitive isotopic traces. These age and isotopic maps are building what we've dubbed an isotopic atlas of Australia. The central image here shows a stack of different age and isotopic coverages. In the same way that different geophysical coverages provide information about different physical aspects of the continent, these different isotopic maps provide different and complementary information about aspects of the geological history and chemical evolution of the continent. In 2020, we presented a vision for this isotopic atlas in an Exploring for the Future extended abstract, shown in the lower right of this image. Since that time, there have been developments both in the density and diversity of datasets and perhaps most significantly in the online delivery of these datasets via the GA portal. These age and isotopic datasets are a national asset. Australian scientists have been at the forefront of international isotope geoscience for several decades. They have developed new methods and applied those methods in systematic ways. The isotopic atlas is an effort to maximise the value of this science excellence and put it in the hands of a wider group of users. Perhaps the most foundational coverage in the isotopic atlas is the National Compilation of Radiometric Ages. Geoscience Australia has an ongoing program of acquiring new geochronology, primarily via our in-house sensitive high-resolution iron microprobe instrument. And we've been delivering that data in publications and online in its full detail for over 15 years. In addition to delivering the data that we generate in-house, over the past few years we've put considerable effort into compiling radiometric ages from other published sources and delivering a national view of all available ages. This is what you see here. This is a screenshot from the Geochronology and Isotopes persona within the GA portal. There are now around 7,000 ages available here from publications as early as, as early as the 1960s through to the present. GA has been a major player in the acquisition of this national geochronology coverage, with over 3,000 of these ages coming from GA publications. Our state survey partners and the university geoscience sector are also big and ongoing contributors here. 
Given the time, effort and cost that goes into sample collection, isotopic analysis, interpretation and publication of each one of these data points, this map represents at least $20 million worth of value. We're pretty confident that this is the most comprehensive geochronology coverage that's ever been publicly available for Australia. A national coverage like this puts the first order results of specialist geochronological studies directly in the hands of mineral explorers, rather than them having to trawl through the specialist literature to extract the relevant information. This coverage also provides us and others with a guide to the major data gaps and where we can have the most future impact with additional data collection. We're aware from our geochronological studies in frontier areas, including with our collaborators from MINEX CRC in national drilling initiative campaigns, that new geochronology from frontier areas is a key data set that draws exploration interest and activity. And having a relatively comprehensive coverage of ages compiled and classified with consistent terminology allows us to view this data in new and powerful ways as a time sequence. To illustrate this, we have recently released some thematic videos of Australia's geological history through time. What you'll see here is the geochronology data set filtered to show only magmatic ages, that is the ages of igneous rocks. The video plays from 3.5 billion years ago through to the present, and the results are shown against a backdrop of the national magnetic coverage with an overlay of the major crustal boundaries. You can see the episodic history of igneous activity starting in the Pilbara and Yilgarn cratons in the west and progressively building eastwards through the Proterozoic and then Phanerozoic. Here I want to acknowledge the work of Wanches Saktura from the University of Wollongong who worked with us to, to develop these videos and he did a great job. Viewing the data in this animated way provides a much clearer impression of the major episodes of activity and equally emphasises relatively long periods of little or no magmatism. This has clear implications for the prospectivity of many mineral systems which involve magmatism, either directly as carriers of metals or as heat sources to drive hydrothermal fluids. But the isotopic atlas is not only about geochronology. In addition to ages of particular rock units in the upper crust, we can also use isotopic traces such as Samarium neodymium to image the progressive building of the mid and lower crust. This was first done at continental scale by David Champion in 2013 by a compilation of neodymium model ages. At that time, the total data coverage included just over 2,500 points and was filtered to just over 1,600 points from felsic magmatic rocks to, to produce this gridded map that you see on the left-hand side. We have recently released an updated version of this Sumerian neodymium data set and map, again led by Dave Champion. The new data set has more than doubled the data coverage. There are now approximately 8,000 data points with almost 3,500 coming from felsic magmatic rocks and producing this updated national model age map on the right. I've highlighted a couple of regions in the red and yellow ellipses to show where the improvement in data coverage is particularly evident. For those not familiar with the concept of model age, you might be asking, what's the difference between this model age map and the ages of igneous rocks we were just looking at in the video animation? In general, most of the igneous rocks shown in our video are the result of partial melting in the relatively deep parts of the continental crust, typically at depths of say 20 kilometres or more. But another question we can ask is, how long has that deep continental crust been there before it was partially melted? Or put another way, when were the deep foundations of our continent extracted out of the Earth's mantle and added to the continental crust? This is essentially what the Neodymium model ages represent. The new Neodymium map has been used as an input to update the national interpretation of major crustal boundaries first released by Korsh and Dublier in 2016, with a 2024 update led by Michael Dublier released just a couple of months ago and shown here by the red line work. And in turn, the major crustal boundaries, as well as more local gradients in Neodymium model age, have been shown to be a key predictor of the locations of multiple mineral systems, enabling predictive mineral potential models. An example is this recently released iron oxide copper gold prospectivity map. You'll hear more about these prospectivity maps tomorrow in a presentation by Ariane Ford. The mapping of crustal growth and crustal architecture via neodymium isotopes is now being complemented by lutetium hafnium analyses of zircon. This image is a very recent example from southeastern Australia from the work of David Mole here at GA. Here we see crystallisation ages of igneous rocks depicted by the coloured dots and the background coloured contours show lutetium hafnium model ages of the mid to lower crust. 
similar to the neodymium model ages we've seen in the previous slides. This image very nicely maps out the margin of the Proterozoic South Australian craton, shown in the purple colours, with the younger, more juvenile crust of the Tasmanides, shown in the green and yellow colours. David will talk in more detail about this work on Friday this week, including its implications for mineral systems fertility along this paleocontinental margin. In complement to the neodymium and hafnium maps we've just been looking at, lead isotopes in ores reveal systematic patterns related to the origin of mineralizing fluids and the chemical composition of the rocks from which those fluids were derived. In particular, variation in lead isotope composition tracks the extent and timing of enrichment of uranium and thorium in the crust, as these are the elements that produce radiogenic lead isotopes. A national coverage of lead isotopes in ores was published in 2019 by Dave Houston and co-workers and is shown by the image on the left here. This data set is now available to view or download via the GA portal. As you might expect, we see a general pattern of more evolved lead isotopic signatures from ores in the older cratonic parts of Australia, shown in the brown and yellow colours, with more juvenile lead signatures shown by the green colours, mainly in the Tasmanides of Eastern Australia. But there is considerable detail that can be drawn out of this data set at more local scales. The image on the top right shows some of that detail in the Carpentaria zinc belt straddling the Queensland Northern Territory border, one of the richest base metal provinces in the world. In that region, Dave Houston noted that the lead zinc deposits shown by the light blue dots lie along a pronounced gradient in the lead isotope map. That isotopic gradient also corresponds to the edge of older thicker lithosphere to the west shown in the blue colours in the lower right image, compared with thinner and younger lithosphere to the east, shown in the red colours. This relationship has subsequently been shown to hold in other sediment-hosted base metal provinces, providing a guide for future exploration. While already very useful on its own, the lead in ores data set can be placed in more detailed context by an improved coverage of lead isotopes outside the ore systems, essentially a background lead isotope map from basement rocks. Such a map has not previously been developed in Australia at broad scale, and possibly not anywhere in the world. Over the past three years, we've collaborated with the research team at Curtin University and the John DeLater Centre to develop a lead in basement map for southern and eastern Australia. This is largely the work of Jana Liebman at Curtin University, funded by the EFTF program, and primarily using the extensive archive of physical samples that GA holds from its geochronology programs with the State and Territory Surveys. The image here shows a map of the isotopic parameter mu, essentially a measure of uranium enrichment in the crust, with more enriched crust shown in yellow and green, and less enriched crust in blue. While this coverage is not yet national, it's well on the way. The Geological Survey of WA has been funding an equivalent coverage, also through the Curtin University team, which will complement the coverage shown here. And there's clear scope for future work to extend the coverage across Northern Australia to build a fully national data set and to improve the density of data coverage. The neodymium, hafnium and lead isotope coverages that I've mentioned so far have been derived from basement rocks and have application to the timing and processes of crustal growth and to tracking the origin of ores and ore fluids. But isotopic traces can also be applied on transported surface materials. Here we see two relatively new isotopic coverages based on surface samples collected by Geoscience Australia approximately 15 years ago as part of the National Geochemical Survey of Australia led by Patrice de Caritat. This sample archive has been used in a recent PhD study by Kandan Desen at the University of Melbourne to produce a near national coverage of lead isotope signatures in surface sediments, seen here on the left-hand image. Similarly, on the right-hand side, we see strontium isotopic signatures from surface sediments, collected in collaboration with partners at the University of Wollongong, with scope for expansion towards national scale. These isotopic signatures of surface materials can be used in a range of applications. These include tracking the origin of surface sediments, which can be a key piece of information in interpreting the subtle surface signals of buried mineral deposits. In addition to mineral exploration applications, the data can also find application in archaeology, agriculture, and even forensics. One example of an agricultural application is a relatively new project that we've been part of over the past year or so, funded by the Australian Research Data Commons, and in partnership with CSIRO and ANSTO. That project is aimed at bringing together the isotopic data holdings of CSIRO, ANSTO and GA for use in food provenance applications, essentially to provide an evidence base for tracking the provenance of foodstuffs and the assurance about the processes and inputs used in food production. The chemical and isotopic composition of our foods is a product of the soils it was grown in, 
the fertilizers used to nourish it, and the surface and groundwaters taken in by those foods during their growth. In this project, GA's holdings of isotopic data from soils and groundwater are being complemented by data from water and food that is held by CSIRO and ANSTO. I don't want to finish without providing at least a very quick guide as to how to find the various data sets that I've presented today. This image is a screenshot from the GA portal. If you were tuning in to yesterday's presentations, you'd have heard more about the GA portal from Mark Webster. The URL in the bottom right will take you to the Geochronology and Isotopes persona of the GA portal. The default coverage you'll see from this URL is the radiometric age coverage as shown here. The list of layers on the left hand side of this page also provides you access to the various isotopic coverages I've mentioned, such as neodymium, lead, strontium, etc. Clicking on any particular data point will bring up the relevant data and metadata about that point shown in the panel on the right hand side. This also includes a link to the original published source of that data. And once you've found the data coverage you're interested in, there are various ways it can be filtered within the portal, for example according to geographic region or rock type or interpreted geological process. And then you can download either the entire data set or a filtered subset by clicking on the About button and then the Download button as highlighted here in yellow. As you can see, the data can be downloaded in a variety of formats. So to sum up, we are very familiar with national scale geological maps and geophysical images. In some ways, the isotopic community has been behind the curve in putting our data together in similar national coverages. There are a variety of reasons for this, including the relatively labour intensive nature of sample by sample analyses. However, I hope this presentation has shown that we now have sufficient data coverage to make meaningful and useful national scale isotopic maps. And these data sets are now easily accessible in one place by the GA portal. As with the expanding portfolio of geophysical coverages at ever increasing resolution, there is great potential to continue to grow the range and resolution of our isotopic data sets, providing extra dimensions to our understanding of the processes that have led to our current resource endowment and providing increased predictive power in our search for more of the resources that we'll need to meet future demand. I want to finish by acknowledging that the development of these national data sets would not have been possible without the combined efforts of many in the Australian geoscience community. Much of this work rests on the foundations of Australia's long history of leadership in isotope geoscience in our university sector, as well as its application in geological surveys. In particular, the development of the Isotopic Atlas would not have been possible without the GA Laboratories team, collaborations and data sharing with our state and territory geological survey colleagues, and with our university collaborators, ANU, Curtin, University of Wollongong, Uni of Melbourne and University of Alberta. We thank them all and we look forward to continuing to develop these data sets and the insights that come from them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. This is a very impressive outcome, considering that uh, when we started EFTF, we only had national coverage, I think, for neodymium and just the beginning for the national coverage of geochronology. This work has really come a very long way uh, in the past eight years. So congratulations to the team. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Guillaume Sanchez, who will present on the first continental layered geological map of Australia. So Guillaume is a geoscientist at Geoscience Australia with a PhD in tectonics and geochronology from the University of Nice Sophie Antipolis in France. With 15 years of experience in the resource industry and academia, Guillaume specializes in multidisciplinary integrated geoscience with a focus on 3D geological and physical property modeling to study earth surfaces and surface, sorry, and subsurface processes. Over to you, Guillaume. Thank you. The Australian Net Zero mission requires a high level of understanding, strategic and sustainable exploitation of a subsurface. There will be no transition to a low carbon economy supported by clean technology without high quality subsurface data and geological expertise. Today, I will be presenting the world's first layered geological map of Australia at the continental scale. But let's go back in time and set the scene for this study. In the past 25 years, discoveries of new resources have declined. At the same time, the demand in critical and strategic mineral have significantly increased. This set the vision for the national strategy formalized in the Uncover Initiative 
and exploring for the future program, or EFTF for short, at Geoscience Australia, established in 2016. The main goal of this program was to first provide the knowledge base and technology to better understand the potential for mineral, energy and groundwater in the frontier covered area of Australia. Secondly, was to deliver integrating multidisciplinary pre-competitive data that will support and reduce the risk of exploration. There are a large part of Australia that has not yet been explored effectively. If you look at this map, this is a map of the geology of Australia with the mineral deposit we are currently mining. And you can see they tend to cluster in some specific areas. Actually, much of Australia's historical discoveries lie in the 30% uncovered or near uncovered areas, meaning outcrops, thanks to a massive effort in mapping Australia's surface in the past century. This culminated in the release of a surface geology map of Australia in 2012, as you can see on the right. This map is, however, limited to the surface and does not contain explicit information of the extent of geological units away from the outcrop and the cover. But we know that the prospective geology that hosts world-class mineral deposits like Manaisa or Olympic Dam extend under the vast cover represented on this map by the pale colours. So the question is, how can we understand the geology under those covered areas at the same level we understood the geology at the surface? In other words, how can we map and visualise the subsurface geology that is largely unknown in those areas? This is fundamental not only to assess the prospectivity of those areas for mineral, but also for energy and groundwater systems that are needed to support the net zero carbon emissions. So how do we address this challenge? How do we transition from geological maps that represent the geology in two dimensions to mapping buried geology and adding the third dimension, the depth, at the national scale? When said like that, it seems pretty difficult, right? The construction of a geology in three dimensions based solely from 2D surface geology at the national scale is extremely challenging. So many complexities in the geology, so many data to handle, and also sparsely distributed across the country. So how do we do it? Well, we have done it by following this approach. We organize the geological units in multiple layers following a chronostratific approach. As a starting point, we design the different layers to highlight era geological boundaries, as they represent major variation in the stratigraphy linked to major geological events. This approach is particularly powerful for special regional correlation of a geology across Australia. So at the time we began this work, there was no internally consistent national scale map of a subsurface geology. Maps were coming from states and territory and Geoscience Australia in different format, coverage and scale, as you can see in these two maps. So to establish a national consistent coverage and maximize the use of existing map, we first started by compiling all of the existing geological data set at the regional scale. Maps with scale ranging from 1 in 250k to 1 in 2.5 million were included with minimal modification, except when more recent data sets were available. We then refined locally the interpretation through an iterative process using other data sets that I will present in the next few slides. This data integration process represents a big effort, and it's probably one of the most time-consuming tasks we had to do. But it was fundamental to finally reconcile differences in geological interpretation across state and territory borders or between different data sets too. As I just mentioned, we use Geoscience Australia National Geophysical Dataset as well as the state and territory service regional data to extend the known geology and the cover. We primarily use the total magnetic intensity grid of Australia as well as urban electro electronic mag magnetic data. In some places, when available, we also use the national gravity map. Then we used a recent national compilation of borehole data, the Australian Borehole Stratigraphic Unit Compilation, released in 2003 and recently updated this year. You'll hear more about that, that set in Nadej Rolet Talk tomorrow. 
We use this borehole compilation together with the Surface Geology of Australia to convert the geophysical information into geology. Here is an example. To the left, we can see the Paleozoic rocks colored by age at the payer level extracted from the surface geology, as well as the ball colored by the stratigraphic age of intersected stratigraphic units over the grayscale magnetic data set. To the right is how these units were extended to match borehole interpretation. You can see the extent of Permian or Carboniferous intrusives. And finally, to the right is a resulting interpretation with a different geological units colored by stratigraphic edge extended away from the expression at the surface. So by following this approach, we captured existing interpretation of a subsurface, undertook new interpretation where required, and harmonized the geology across states and territory borders. The first release was the North Australian Craton back in 2020. And we now present the first layer geological map of Australia this is to date the world first at the continental scale. The layered geological map of Australia contains data representing around 7,600 distinct geological units subdivided into five chronostratific layers at the era level. The Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Neoproterozoic and Pre-Neoproterozoic. Each layer represents rocks as if they were present at the surface if overlying units were removed. The Cenozoic was extracted from the surface geology. Numbers indicate the number of polygons within the layers. Although this is arbitrary in some extent, it gives an order of magnitude of the amount of information it includes. If we exclude the Cenozoic, the Paleozoic, and the Prenozoic layers have the highest number of polygons. Altogether, it represents a total of 180,000 polygons. This data set is meant to be used at an optimal scale of one in one million. The layer geology map of Australia is also linked to the Australian Strategic Unit Database, or ASAT for short. The database is a fundamental asset for the Australian community. It provides information on the chronostratigraphy and the lithostratigraphic of geological units. 780 units were actually specifically created for the layer geology map. In detail, each polygon is attributed with stratigraphic age and lithology. For example, the map to the left represents an extract of a Mesozoic layer across Queensland and New South Wales. First of all, you can see stratigraphic units for Permian and Triassic to Upper Cretaceous. These are colored from purple, blue to green. And secondly, you can see with the north-south orientation, the New England origin intrusive colored in a shade of reds. Let's now take a closer look. Here's a zoom onto the New England origin intrusive. You can fly over the intrusive and straight away see the granite with different age and composition, meaning whether it's felsic or intermediate, S-type or I-type intrusive, just by looking at the colors of a polygon representing the edge, as well as the type and the colors of the patterns that represent the rock composition. In a similar way, you can visualize sedimentary sequences and the different deposition environment just by examining colors and patterns of polygons. As the knowledge of Australia's subsurface geology is increasing, and also it's likely that we have missed some relevant data sets, the layer geology map of Australia will need updating. For example, the solid geology map of the East Tenant region that was undertaken during the EFTF East Tenant drilling program is already included in the data set. However, the solid geology map of the Loch Leggy Cars and Lake Winklow Belt capturing interpretation of Cambrian and younger magmatic rock as part of the FTF De La Marion Kahnemana Darling project will be included in the next, next version. On that note, I recommend to see the presentation from Chris Lewis if you want to know more about the result of the FTF De La Marion project. Finally, we want to mention that this data set will al be also updated following any release or new release from state and territory geological mapping program. As we have just seen, seen Linking the layered geological map of Australia with the Australian Strategic Unit database allows us to have a database that can be queried and visualized in any software, GIS, or even 3D modeling packages. This geology a la carte creates a more flexible use for people to quickly produce thematic map, highlighting geological units of a certain age or specific lithologies. For example, I've extracted the mafic and ultramafic rocks of a layered geological map of Australia as shown to the right. This is also a great way to highlight new findings. When compared with the compilation released in 2014 to the left, we can see the improvement after the FTF program. In particular, 
the refinement of the extent of the Kalkarinji large Inuks province in the Northern Territory. The map now shows that the Kalkarinji large Inuks province spans 190,000 kilometers square, which is an order of magnitude smaller than the previous estimates. In parallel to the layered geological map of Australia, we have developed a thematic product, the Alkaline Rock Atlas of Australia. Alkaline igneous rocks are a relatively rare class of igneous rocks worldwide that are recognized as a significant source of critical and strategic mineral like rare earth, niobium, tantal, zirconium, afnium, or copper. However, these rocks are volumetrically minor in Australia. And this is an issue for one who wants to assess the mineral pers perspectivity for those critical mineral systems, as some important host units may not be fully captured in a one in one million layer geology. To reduce the risk that some prospective units may be misrepresented or incorrectly weighted in the mineral potential assessment, the Alkaline Rock Atlas of Australia was created as a standalone product. Like the layered geology, the atlas is a layered product consisting of a GS dataset with an attribute rich metadata for five time slices, which we can see here on the map. Each layer captures key information for every individual alkaline rock unit, including stratigraphic name consistent with the ESAT database, lithologies, age, emplacement type, presence of xenolith and diamonds, and many more. We, are, we have also defined informal alkaline provinces, large color polygons on the map for each layer, grouping units of similar age and composition. So we have now fully demonstrated what contains the layered geology map of Australia, as well as how we built it. I hope you are excited as we are, as we have seen that the layered geological map of Australia that has significantly expanded our understanding of Australia geology undercover. It reveals the exploration search, search space for mineral energy and groundwater across Australia at unprecedented level of detail. Just as an example, the geological units of the Paleo and Mesopotamic age mapped in the layer geology dataset, which are known to host major mineral deposits in Australia like Manaza or Olympic Dam, represent 9.5 fold increase in mapped surface area compared to the surface geology map. The layer geological map of Australia and the Alkaline Rock Atlas of Australia have already been used for predictive assessment of mineral potential. Here are two predictive models that make use of these two national geological dataset, Alkaline Rock for the carbonated model to the left and the layer geological model for IOCG syst uh, mineral system. Each model highlights regions with no previously identified mineralization related to the mineral system modeled. The presentation from Ironfront will go into more detail on the methodology and the results. To complement the layer geological map with depth to mapped layers, we implemented a national chronostratigraphic compilation and interpretation of depth to era boundaries. This information were compiled and stored in two main national databases. First, the Austrian borehole strategic unit compilation dataset that contains chronostratigraphic attributed borehole information. Secondly, the estimates of geological and geophysical surfaces X database that stores standardized chronostratigraphic attributed DEF estimate derived from AM interpretation, DEF to magnetic source, and stratigraphic borehole. You'll see in the next presentation by Sebastian Wang and tomorrow in the presentation by Nadej Rollet, more detailed explanation of how these different national databases and datasets were compiled and used together with the layered geological map of Australia and the Australian study of the unit database to construct 3D geological model using interpolation and machine learning algorithms. So we are now in a position where on one hand, we have a completed layered geological map of Australia with a national coverage. And on the other hand, we have a 3D model of sedimentary basins across Australia, as you will see tomorrow and you can see on this map. Overall, this will help producing an integrated 3D layered model of Australia and ident identify new prospective areas for mineral, groundwater and energy. Finally, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the Cenozoic layer of a layered geological map of Austria is extracted from the surface geology. As we know, the surface geology map is 12 years old and it represents the distribution of rocks at the surface. However, the map and most geological map, actually in general, tend to overestimate the, the amount of bedrock exposed at the surface or even miss some of the bedrock exposure due to shallow cover. To address this issue, and to make geological maps more spatially explicit and accurate, 
we develop an outcrop detection methodology using machine learning and satellite imagery. Outcrops and areas of very shallow cover over bedrocks were detected with good accuracy in the two tested area in regional New South Wales. This represents the first step, the proof of concept, and it set the path of a new generation of surface geology map as we plan to upscale this approach nationally. So in summary, by expanding on the work of others, we have reconciled the geology at the national scale. We have provided a comprehensive view of the structure and composition of the Australian crust, narrowing scientific knowledge gaps and revealing the exploration search space for natural resources. Through the development of a consistent chronostatographic framework, the layer geology map of Australia, together with death estimate, is a significant step towards a continental 3D geological model of Australia. As evidence of this achievement, the layer geologic map and the alkaline rocks atlas have already been used for national resource assessment. Finally, we show that detecting air crop is possible at local scale. This approach will be extended nationally, making the surface jury more explicit. We would like to finish by analyzing the significant contribution of colleagues from Geosensoria, as many are listed below, as well as collaborators from State and Territory Geological Survey. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Guillaume. Such an amazing work. Uh, this layered geology map of Australia is actually the result of around a decade of data standardization and harmonization that we did in collaboration with the state and territory partners. So when I've been part of this work, I'm still amazed to see uh, the, the, the achievement of that team uh, at this scale. So it's very impressive. Thank you. For the last talk today, uh, we will hear from Sebastian Wong on an integrated 3D layered cover modeling approach towards open source data and methodologies for national scale cover modeling. Sebastian is a geoscientist responsible for national scale integration and interpretation of multidimensional and multidisciplinary depth estimate data for cover thickness modeling. Sebastian studied geology at the University of Newcastle here in Australia and has prior experience working for the Geological Survey of New South Wales and in the minerals and energy industries. Over to you, Seb. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. As you mentioned in the previous talk, we're working towards an integrated 3D chronostratigraphic configuration of the Australian continent. I want to continue to build on this theme by presenting our pipeline from data interpretation all the way through to cover modelling and the data and tools that we use along the way. I'm presenting this work on behalf of my team and collaborators, some of whom are listed here. As you've seen in Guillaume's presentation on the layered geology maps, these are created at key chronostratigraphic boundaries, the geological eras. As we're working at a national scale and working in parallel with a layered geology team, we work at the same chronostratigraphic resolution. Essentially, we are creating a depth component to these boundaries. Therefore, our aim in our team is to look at the depth to these boundaries to understand the thickness of various cover sequences and the depth to basement rocks. So why are we doing this and why is it important? Well, the main driver uh, for this work is to understand the subsurface geology of the Australian continent, which is important because approximately 80% of the Australian continent is covered by Cenozoic sediments and regolith. And despite some of these overlying basins and paleo valleys being prospective for groundwater resources and some minerals and energy, these younger sequences obscure our access to the rocks that lie beneath, which can be prospective for the mineral resources critical for our transition to net zero. And as demand for base and precious metals uh, is rapidly increasing to accelerate this transition to net zero, mineral explorers are adjusting their strategies to explore deeper underground. This identifies the need for quantitative knowledge of the subsurface geology, where the spatial distributions and depth to stratigraphic units can be queried. And despite the wealth of subsurface data available across the continent, their uneven distributions, various quality and diverse data formats prevent the development of consistent national subsurface models. So a national coordination of data compilation with common standards, along with development of open source, modeling tools in line with the FAIR data principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable are required to address this challenge. So I think the best way to explain our work in this space is by presenting a conceptual overview. 
So over the past few decades, we've developed an excellent understanding of the surface geology via field mapping, air photo interpretation, and remote sensing. And in recent years, we started to extend that understanding to the subsurface with maps like the layer geology. However, our understanding of the depth to these rocks is limited. So how do we see through that cover to gain a better understanding of what lies beneath? Well, we can use geophysical techniques such as the non-invasive and cost-effective AUSAM Airborne Electromagnetic Survey, or AEM survey. We can interpret these data to produce an abundance of depth estimates. However, despite covering large parts of the continent, this technique is limited to imaging 500 meters depth. So we need other techniques to see deeper. To do this, we can collect, compile, and interpret borehole data. This is an excellent way to gain information on the stratigraphy and lithology at specific points in space. However, boreholes are costly to acquire. It can be time consuming to compile and quality control legacy borehole data, and they're limited to a depth of only a few kilometers. These can be sparsely distributed, especially in underexplored areas as well. So we need other techniques to see deeper and to fill the space between boreholes. Here we can utilize deeper imaging geophysical techniques for example, we can model the depth to magnetic anomalies, which is what this animation is illustrating. At Geoscience Australia, we are the custodian of a great deal of geophysical data stored in the Geophysical Archive and Data Delivery System, also known as GADS. We can model these data sets to produce further depth estimates in underexplored areas. This is a very cost-effective way to utilize existing geophysical data sets to produce large amounts of depth estimates which is something that we have recently done in collaboration with CSIRO across specific study areas nationwide. These depth estimates are consistently formatted to harmonize specific information regardless of the acquisition or interpretation disciplines. This allows for standardized depth estimates to be uploaded and stored in our national depth estimate database, where they're readily available for download and use in a variety of investigative and mo modeling activities. And because these points are attributed with chronostratigraphic and other supporting information, they can be directly used for modeling the depth to the key chronostratigraphic boundaries. To do this, we've worked internally and with external partners on the development of open source cover, cover modeling techniques. Ultimately, we are working on the full pipeline from data interpretation through to modeling to provide data and tools required for national scale cover modeling activities. These data and tools are publicly available and will contribute to developing a better understanding of the chronostratigraphic configuration of the Australian continent. So to facilitate collection and interpretation of high quality depth estimates, we've developed and released various workflows and tools. We've developed an AEM interpretation workflow that works on open source software. This tool facilitates integration of supporting data and creation of detailed interpretations of AEM conductivity sections, such as seen here. Outputs from this tool are not bound by any proprietary limitations and provided in multi-dimensional formats, which are suitable for uploading to our National Depth Estimate database and the 3D layers on the GA portal. And these can also be imported into a wide range of software packages. We're currently working on a graphical user interface version of this tool to make it more accessible and user-friendly. So watch this space. In its current state, this workflow has been used to interpret almost 120,000 line kilometers of regional AEM conductivity sections. This covers over a quarter of the Australian continent. This has resulted in over half a million depth estimate points or 30,000 interpretation line segments being produced. The motivation behind development of this workflow was in response to the requirements of creating detailed AEM interpretations of the AUSAM survey which is seen in the background of this main figure. As you can see, we've interpreted a lot of AEM with this workflow. However, there's still a lot to go. And this is where other tools developed at GA can assist. For example, we've also developed a semi-automated AEM interpretation tool that utilizes machine learning algorithms to predict the base of Cenozoic stratigraphy along AEM conductivity sections. This tool is trained on human interpretation and integrates a wide range of covariates to predict the base of Cenozoic stratigraphy into uninterpreted areas. As subsurface conductivity values can relate to a wide range of factors, 
This tool integrates AEM with supporting datasets and looks for statistical correlations between datasets. The top image here gives an example of a supporting dataset, the weathering intensity in the blue line. The bottom figure is a detail showing the prediction of the base of Cenozoic in pink compared to a human interpretation in black. The code base for this tool is available on the GitHub page and an Exploring for the Future or EFTF Extended Abstract has been released describing the methodology. We have also co-developed an online magnetic depth estimate tool as part of a collaboration with CSIRO. This tool allows users to access magnetic data from GADs and model the depth of magnetic anomalies without the requirement for any specialized software. This was developed as a proof of concept and has been released as a beta version with several magnetic surveys available for use across the country. We currently have the intention of adding additional surveys and improvements to the tool with time. It uses magnetic line data for modeling the depth to the magnetic source as seen here and was designed to facilitate collection of depth estimates to support our depth estimate database and cover modeling activities. You can access this tool through the tools tab or through the persona options on the GA portal. And if you're interested in having a go of using this tool, user feedback would be highly regarded and can be provided through the portal. So where do we store our depth estimates? We store them in the Estimates of Geological and Geophysical Surfaces database, also referred to as EGS. This database was created to house consistently formatted national depth estimate data to help address data variability found in large datasets and compilations. We currently have points from three disciplines stored in EGS, AEM interpretation, boreholes, and depth to magnetic source acquired using various modeling techniques. However, we do have the intention of adding additional disciplines such as the interpretation of seismic data and magnetotelluric data. We currently have approximately half a million depth estimate points stored in the database, all of which are available on the EGS database accessible on the GA portal. All data uploaded to EGS have been thoroughly curated and quality controlled to ensure only high quality data is imported into the database. Every point is accompanied by an abundance of metadata, which is where I see the true value in these points. Here are just some examples of some of the key metadata fields accompanying our depth estimates. Now, just to give you an example of the power of this metadata, I've filtered the points on the age attribute based on the geological eras. So the Cenozoic points clearly show the depth to the base of the Murray Basin, which overlies rocks perspective for precious and base metal resources. The Mesozoic points show the depth to the base of the Carpentaria and Eramanga basins, which overlie the world-class Mount Isa and Klonghari Mineral District. The Paleozoic points delineate the Georgina and Wiseau basins, which are prospective for phosphate deposits, an important ingredient in fertilizers. The Neoproterozoic points highlight the depth to the Neoproterozoic rocks in the Amadeus Basin, which are currently producing gas resources, and the pre neoproterozoic points show the depth to the officer basin to basement contact and map the depth of prospective stratigraphy in the Kernamona Craton, which hosts the world-class lead zinc silver deposits. Some other examples of the value these metadata add include the stratigraphic units being consistent with the Australian Stratigraphic Units database, which can inform on lithological characteristics of the rocks, identify the presence of prospective stratigraphy, and facilitates tracking and applying stratigraphic unit updates in eggs. The stratigraphic relationships inform on the depositional continuity or hiatuses, or if the contacts are faulted, overturned, or intrusive. The confidences aid modeling, helping users weight different inputs and model uncertainty. The basis of interpretation directs users to the data that supports the interpretation, such as the layer geology, boreholes, and so on and the comments can provide further information to the users. So how do we use these data? Well, we have two methods that we use in our team for cover modeling, Loop and Uncover ML. So we have partnered with Monash University as part of the Loop 3D Consortium, where they've developed an open source implicit interpolator for our multi-layered modeling. A key benefit of using this tool is the ability to account for inequality constraints, simply meaning that we can add upper and lower bounds to the models based on the depth of points above and below the surface we're modeling, 
which is what this illustration is depicting. This is beneficial for creating well-informed models, especially in data poor areas. This tool is available on the Loop GitHub page. We've also utilized machine learning algorithms developed as part of UncoverML that we've applied to cover modeling. This tool learns the relationship between depth estimate points and a range of supporting covariates. Importantly, machine learning allows us to integrate a wide range of data with our depth estimates, which leads to the production of highly detailed models. This methodology has been published in the EFTF Extended Abstract and the code is available from GitHub. So let's have a look at some cover modeling results. So each of these panels represent the depth to the geological eras in the darling Kernamona delamerian project area, also known as DCD which is described in detail in Yambo's presentation in the regional deep dive session. These models were generated using the loop method that uses the base of geological error points from eggs, which are displayed here, inequality constraints, which are these small points, also from eggs, outcrop geology, which gives us a zero depth constraint. And this leads to well-constrained models that are generated with a top-down approach so that surfaces don't intersect or cross over. If you're interested, you can access these cover models on the portal, on the GA portal, and the points and grid and an extended abstract can be accessed at the DOIs on the screen here. We've also used UncoverML cover modeling approach to model the depth to the base of the Cenozoic in the DCD project area. This is a twin model approach where we input the interpolated base of Cenozoic cover model from loop as seen on the previous slide, as a starting model. The machine learning approach was applied only to the base of Cenozoic boundary due to the lack of powerful covariates at depth. This is because many of our covariates are from the surface or near surface. So this approach is suited to modeling the near surface boundaries. Accounting for the near surface covariates allow us to better predict cover associated with the landscape. This results in more detail being added to the model especially in areas of shallow cover. This approach can be utilized in studies that are interested in near surface features, such as groundwater studies, assessment of paleo valleys, exploring for basement highs, or any other study that are interested in investigating the shallow geology. So the collection, compilation, and curation of these points has led to generation of reproducible layered cover models that currently cover approximately 25% of the Australian continent as seen here in the recently produced DCD cover models in southeastern Australia and the Tizer or Tennant Creek to Mount Isa cover models in northern Australia which were produced earlier on in the EFTF program. So how can we use these models? Firstly, we can drape the layered geology on the cover models to produce cover models attributed with stratigraphic information, which gives us the model depth to certain stratigraphic units. As seen here with the layered geology draped on the national cover models produced as part of the National Groundwater Systems Project, which will be presented by Nadej in an upcoming session. These integrated stratigraphic cover models have wide ranging applications, from building a better understanding of the Australian continent's stratigraphic configuration to resource and feasibility studies. Just to emphasize the importance of the layered cover models in exploration and feasibility studies, I've run two models using Geoscience Australia's Economic Fairways tool, which is a resource extraction economic viability assessment tool. What I've done is I've run two assessments of the economic viability of developing equally sized zinc lead silver deposits beneath either Mesozoic or Neoproterozoic cover. As you can see in these cover models, the depth to the base of the Mesozoic rocks is considerably shallower in the western part of this study area when compared to the depth of the base of Neoproterozoic rocks. When we compare the two economic fairways models, we can see that developing a deposit beneath Mesozoic rocks is economically viable over large parts of that western area. However, the economic viability of developing that deposit beneath Neoproterozoic rocks is greatly reduced due to the thicker overburden over that deposit. This is an excellent example of the power of our multi-layered products and the support these products provide to the resource industry. So to summarize, we've developed open source depth estimate collection and interpretation workflows. These are used in our chronostratigraphic interpretations and facilitate quality control, formatting and harmonization of our data.
which are then uploaded into the openly accessible eggs database from which these data are extracted and used in various open source modeling tools and workflows. These workflows output our layered cover models, which have a wide range of users. However, this is an iterative process as our cover models and depth estimate points inform future work as they provide depth data that are used in subsequent interpretations and help to refine future models. Ultimately, by leading the development of an open source data and modeling infrastructure, Geoscience Australia is transforming the way legacy and pre-competitive data should be digitally managed to be machine readable to address the challenges of developing a national chronostratigraphic framework. This work would not have been possible without the collaboration of the State and Territory Geological Surveys and the other organisations listed on this slide. So I want to thank them and acknowledge them for their contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seb. There is certainly a huge amount of work going into this uh, and really creating this uh, community of users, making the data fair, like findable, accessible, uh, interoperable and reusable. And also, uh, like what was mentioned yesterday by uh, Cam McCuegg, uh, focusing on the human data interaction, those are key to building the next generation of the layered geological models. So thank you very much. I think this brings us to the Q&A session. So our speakers are here in the studio with us, ready to answer your questions. If you haven't already, I invite you to add your question in the Q&A panel and include the name of the presenter you would like to ask. The speakers today have presented, presented on behalf of a large team. So if they cannot answer your very pointy technical question or if we are running out of time, please uh, don't hesitate to send us your question via our email and they will be very happy to take it on notice. So maybe before we start with the online questions, I have a question for all of you here. So in your different talks, you presented on separate uh, components of the Australian geology. How do you see um, bringing together those different components to grow a holistic understanding of the Australia geology? So who would like to start with this one first? Well, I'll have a, I'll have a crack. Thank um, you. Thanks, Mario, for the question. Um, really, I guess your question, in some ways to me, just encapsulates what we're doing here in, over the whole program and, and what we've been seeing over the session so far and what we're going to hear over the rest of the week, that really we are trying to run a, an integrated program where all the different disciplines complement each other and we can bring those together, those different data sets together in different ways um, for particular applications. And we'll see more of that for resource assessments tomorrow. Um, but I guess some really good examples we've seen already today are, are the, the layered geological map that Guillaume talked about that really is a uh, an integrative product that's utilising geophysical data sets, geochronological data sets, um, geological maps at various scales, and bringing that all together into a, a unified understanding, I guess. So um, that, that, that is what we're here for, and um, I think we're making good progress, but obviously there's, the geology is complex and the continent is big, so there's plenty more we can do over the coming years. But I'll maybe pass over to Guillaume or Seb to see if they want to add. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think um, geoscience is a very um, four-dimensional discipline um, and I think that the, the talks that we have just seen um, really encompasses all of that because, um, you know, Jeff has presented on that time component um, and Guillaume and I are looking at the, the more spatial components to that and, um, you know, that's really leading towards that, that sort of 3D um, chronostratigraphic evolution of the Australian continent with, with the time uh, also involved. And um, I think there's, yeah, there's, there's still a lot, as you say, Jeff, a lot of work that can be done, but we're putting all the pieces together to uh, work towards that sort of common goal. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I agree with, yeah, with Jeff and, and, and Seb. Um, um, I, I'm not going to repeat like coming last, obviously. <laughs> Um, but um, if I can add maybe one thing is um, yeah, highlighting this, um, the role of the layer geology, I guess, in really understanding this, this the Australian um, geology. Um, so we've seen all of these data sets collecting, like the geochemical data set you presented, uh, Jeff, but this morning we've seen all of the geophysical data set on the na national level. 
And um, so they are really, um, they provide a lot of um, information, valuable information, but um, uh, what is interesting in the later judges is we've been able to bring um, all of this data set together in one single model. And I think that's where um, all of these components can come together um, to, to fully understand the geology. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, we have a question online here, which is for you, Jeff. So, have the isotopic ages been standardized and corrected given changes in various parameters over time? Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, good to hear from you. And uh, the very short and simple answer to your question is no, they have not. Um, but I can, I guess, go into a little bit more detail. Um, one thing that's worth saying is that the majority of the, the age data that we've compiled so far on, on those uh, compilations that I showed are uranium-led data. N not all of them, but uh, the majority are. And so I think the sort of parameters that you, you're hinting at here are things like decay, content, decay constants and perhaps sometimes the age of standards and reference materials. Um, but within a particular isotopic system like uranium-led, those variations are relatively minor. Um, so um, that's one thing to keep in mind. But certainly as the data sets diversify into different isotopic systems, it is something to be aware of. Um, certainly I've paid quite a lot of attention to that in the, the sort of comparison of uranium-led and and argon-based data sets in the past in, at particular local scales. Um, that is something to be certainly aware of when, because when we've compiled this data, we've essentially compiled what, what has been published to honour what has been through peer review and published. Um, again, just to put some context around that, in that comparison, say, between uranium lead and, and potassium argon-based data, variations or, or updates to decay constants typically sh can shift data by on the order of, well, certainly less than 1%, maybe sort of 0.5, 0.6% is the sort of difference that we're talking about. So um, for the big first order patterns, it's not going to make substantive dif difference to the patterns that we're seeing. But for particular local scale problems, if, if the sort of age resolution that you want is is better than that sort of half percent type of level, then certainly uh, specialists should be paying attention to those sort of um, which parameters have been used and the, and the vintage of the data. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, we have another question for Guillaume this time. So regarding the layered geology map of Australia, so what a great concept. I think we agree on that one. <laughs> Where did you get the idea for this? Okay. Um, so thank you for your question. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I guess uh, maybe we can go back a little bit in time and where all this started. Um, so at the time we had like the, the surface geology, that's uh, the, the only tool we had um, to, um, to assess uh, potential area for, um, for uh, minerals, uh, for any system actually. And um, so, um, and this map actually was already kind of out, uh, out of there. So back in 2012, it was published and, um, and uh, it was already kind of, um, yeah, out of date because it, it's, it's um, a, the culmination of a result of decades of uh, even more of, uh, of, of, um, of work. So, um, so at the time when, when this uh, initiative started, like um, 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 they, we, we were thinking about how, how can we um, uh, go a step further and, and, and uh, people are looking at basement, people are interested in basement, some people are interested in sedimentary covers, some even like the really top surface like in regolits and so that's why actually this concept of, of layer geology so that people can, um, everyone will be like interested in every, uh, in, in a certain type of layers, a certain type of age or, um, and, and um, I think uh, yeah that's, uh, that's where the idea came from. It's also, um, I think it was mentioned um, uh, earlier on, uh, no, yesterday actually by one of the panelists is um, we really need more and more to uh, understand the wall system and this is, this layered concept is also a great, great idea for us to assess the different uh, components in a, in a system. Uh, you can see what's underneath, what's above and, and yeah, uh, I think that's, um, that's where it all um, started and that's where the idea came from. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Yeah, very interesting. Um, another one for you, Jeff. So, great presentation. I noticed a few uranium osmium data points, like four, on the portal. <laughs> Are you planning on extending this isotopic layer? 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Svetlana. Um, what we'd like to do is certainly start building the, the all the layers that we've been talking about today. Um, that includes, you know, various different isotopic systems, and as you've mentioned, rhenium osmium is one where it's not very well represented at the moment. Um, we're, we're not currently um, generating a lot of that rhenium osmium data ourselves. We've we've um, done a little bit of it through um, academic collaborators for particular mineral systems purposes. Um, I guess the, the approach we've taken with pulling these data sets together is really to, to um, compile whatever is out in the public domain. So um, I, I guess I'm happy to talk with you more about you know, future opportunities for using Rhenium Osmium more, because I know you have a lab that can, can help do that. Um, we will attempt to, to bring together whatever data is in the, in the public literature. And I suspect that with future programs in, on, for particular deposit scale studies, uh, Rhenium Osmium could well be part of our, our future data acquisition program. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, a question for you, Seb, this time. Um, so thank you all for the great presentation. So good, good congratulations for everyone here. So what are the type of structural geological characteristics and parameters used for the computer-based machine learning depth estimations? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, with the machine learning, um, as, as shown in the talk, um, the machine learning algorithms use, uh, w we currently are just doing the, uh, the near surface um, uh, layers um, so we've we've done uh, the uh, Cenozoic layer um, in the uh, the cover model um, and the reason we've done that is because the covariates that we use in the uh, machine learning algorithm are very surficial so we use um, we use the uh, like elevation um, slope uh, channels so um, you know the length of um, and, and the the baseline of a uh, uh, channels um, and so using um, oh sorry all, we also use uh, like the 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 units in the surface geology as well so using all these surface geology um, and and other surface um, data sets means that the machine learning algorithms really uh, the shine at getting near surface features um, and 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 modeling them and um, they are the the main uh, uh, covariates that we use in in the um, in the uh, the machine learning algorithm. Um, as far as the um, I, I guess that's the geological uh, characteristics. Um, on the other side of the the, the question, that the parameters used in the um, the, the uh, I, I believe um, I, and I could take this on notice, but I I, I think that that's a, a convoluted neural network. Um, machine learning alg algorithm that's used and um, uh, to form those those cover models. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and there will be an extended abstract published on this uh, on this topic where you can get some, <coughs> some more information. Yeah. Thank you very much. No uh, a question for you, Guillaume. Are the national layered geological map layers consistent with the geological survey of New South Wales, seamless geology layers where they overlap? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Ned. Um, so the short answer is uh, yes, it's uh, consistent. Um, um, if um, I can elaborate a little bit more. Um, so the, the um, methodology we followed is basically collecting all of the data sets from uh, states uh, first and trying to work and, and, comp and reconcile the geology across the borders um, for two reasons. Is the first one is really obviously time consuming to do the interpretation, um, but also um, state surveys, and we th really thanks them for, for, for that, is they have a, a really um, a good knowledge of the local geology. So, um, so as a national organization and body, we, we just wanted to, um, to highlight that. Um, so uh, there's one uh, little area where it's, um, um, it's going to be updated, um, is actually in the local cars, and this has, uh, is published as part of the FTF. Uh, so um, a, a civil different type of data set where collecting seismic uh, in particular, but also like um, some other data sets um, uh, they've been working on in a deep dive area uh, in the Lockley class and a DCD, uh, the Delamayan uh, Kahneman project. Um, and um, a map of the basement geology has been um, produced and created. And this 
really and um, um, highlight uh, a lot of um, Cambrian magmatic art rocks um, that were not previously mapped um, in uh, seamless geology um, of a new uh, Survey of New South Wales. So this will be included um, in the next release. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the maintenance and update of this uh, layer geological map will uh, will be a big, yeah, a big topic moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah thank and you. I think it's fair to say that that Loch Lely Carr's basement geology map that you just mentioned uh, has only very recently been completed. Yeah. Um, so that's a very new thing that'll get fed into Absolutely. new updates, um, and we'll hear more about that on the Friday session, I think, from yeah, the, right, yeah. the from uh, Chris Lewis. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, well, another question for you, Guillaume. Uh, will you be incorporating LIDAR as well as satellite imagery into the outcrop detection workflow? Well, well thank you, Mark, for the question, yeah. Um, so, um, so we haven't um, obviously included that uh, in this workflow. It was like a, a proof of concept in a local area. Um, I understand the, um, um, the benefit of the importance of LIDAR and how this can be used, uh, especially in colored vegetated areas. Um, and yeah, it's definitely something we'll think about it uh, for um, when we'll expand this um, this methodology and this um, um, to the national scale. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, all right, so I have a question for you, Jeff. Um, so it's uh, it's quite amazing to see uh, the diversity of isotopic systems that are being analyzed and mapped across Australia. So within the, the context of critical mineral systems, are there any isotopic systems that you think are strategically more important than others to constrain or expand? Yeah, very good question. Um, yeah, the, the answer to that, um, I guess, hinges perhaps on which uh, strategic critical minerals um, we want to prioritise in the future and, and where people think the, 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 the major benefits are. Um, that's something that we're currently considering as we plan the future program, the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Program. Um, I guess the, the general point I would make is that um, what I'm hoping to get across with this isotopic mapping approach and the various layers and different sample types that we've used is that the isotopic mapping approach and the geochronology can be used to understand a whole range of different geological processes in a similar way to we use lots of different geophysical techniques to understand different physical properties of the continent. And so we can really tailor the way we collect isotopic data, which isotopic system we use and which sample type we use to collect it um, to, to, to hone in on particular questions of interest. So um, it's, not, um, it's not an approach that, that is um, limited to particular types of systems. We can tailor the, the data acquisition that we want to focus on to um, be relevant to a whole range of different mineral systems. And even though we have a, often a mineral systems sort of um, concept in our heads, a lot of the, the data that we're collecting can be used sort of one step back from that to understand the chemical and geological evolution of the continent and geodynamic setting, which then in turn um, can help predict what, which are the, the most fertile areas for particular types of systems. So I think getting that really um, more holistic understanding of the whole evolution of the continent can then be applied in, in so many ways. Um, and we can, and again, we'll, we'll see examples of this tomorrow, I think, from Ariane Ford's um, mineral prospectivity mapping um, presentation where she can show how understanding many different aspects of the geology can be brought together once you have a mineral system concept in mind to, to map that particular system. Yeah, thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, another question for you, Guillaume. Is there a national database compilation of surface mapping observations and location points physically visited during state or territory geological mapping to help distinguish from remote sensing mapping areas? Um, so thanks for the question, Sarah. Um, um, on that uh, question, um, I'm not sure at all, and uh, I will be honest with you. Um, maybe some other can um, um, elaborate on that. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, from on top of that, I don't think so. 
Um, yeah. If you um, oh, I just I sort of see that question almost along the lines of with the say the two fifty camp two fifty k map sheets will have areas where there was sort of boots on the ground mapping and there was areas where there was you know um, um, sort of a, a, a mix between air photo interp and and boots on the ground then just solely air photo interp and um, as far as the solid geology maps um, you know we don't really provide that information with the maps but it is a really good idea and I think you know mm. it is a really good place that we could like move into in the future of like yeah, areas that are um, I guess constrained by boreholes or magnetic data or rocks at outcrop and stuff. Yeah it's that's a good way also to assess the quality of a map um, yeah. so that's, uh, that's uh, something really interesting yeah, too. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, another one again for you, Guillaume. Um, how are you communicating and presenting the varying levels of uncertainty in your combined maps and or different map layers? Uh, so thanks, uh, Chris, for the question. Um, so there is, um, in, in the layer geology um, at the moment, there is no information on um, the level of uncertainty. Um, it's something we are thinking about doing, and we'll, um, as just actually um, Sam mentioned, um, uh, we are going to implement in the next uh, in the future. Um, it's uh, really important um, um, information um, for for anyone interested in in, in using the layer geology. Um, but it's not an easy uh, task to do, and certainty um, it's um, not always um, uh, that straightforward when you extract that from polygons. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll have to develop methodology, uh, actually, to um, so certain type of methodology or workflows to actually address this question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I think that in the in the northern part, in the north Australia region, and I think in eastern part of Australia as well, there are some. Uh, explanatory notes that explains some of the reasoning but that's all that does not cover the yeah. national uh, yeah. the national coverage here. Yeah. Yeah. I guess one problem with that as well is that when when we um, extract polygons and maps from other state and territory partners then um, you know if that information isn't collected from the, or captured at the beginning then we um, have a bit of uncertainty in in what form that interpretation from the beginning so in a way it could be a collaborative approach to finding that information as well mm. and um, yeah as you said working out the methodologies to, yeah. to actually capture that in and build on some dmaps with our data yep. yeah thank you uh, all right so I think uh, we are close to the end here so I would like to wrap to wrap up this session with a final question to all of you uh, so given what what you you presented today and what you have achieved over the last eight years, what would be your vision or what would you like to see moving forward, like let's say in the next five to ten years? So who would like to start with that one, please? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, this is really exciting to think about because I, I guess I think back to, say, 2016 when the Exploring for the Future program started. And at that point, we didn't even have this concept of an isotopic atlas, for example. Um, we had uh, one data set that it was at national scale and it was the first edition Neodymium map that Dave Champion produced. Uh, we didn't at that point even have a anything like a comprehensive national geochronology coverage um, and so and but now we, we do have, have um, various different layers some national some not yet national um, and then you sort of fast forward you know the eight to ten years from now I, I just think there's so much potential to improve the data layers that we already have um, in the, the level of um, data coverage, um, also to diversify them a bit more and, and collect more, and, and that goes back to the question that Svetlana asked about, say, using the Rene Mosmium system a bit more. Um, so I think there's huge potential to, to uh, expand the, the, the coverages and the diversity of the coverages. I guess what I'd, I'd also love to see is that in eight to ten years' time, we're using those age and isotopic coverages quite routinely in, in all of our product development and ideas development, just the way that we use geophysical coverages now. And we, we basically, many of us, I think, sort of almost take for granted that 
when we start a project, we just go and look at the magnetic and gravity coverage or, you know, um, the magnetotelluric or AEM coverage. And I think we can be doing that as these isotopic coverages grow. They become just a standard tool that we use to understand the geology. And I also think there's a lot of potential to start doing more, more innovative things uh, in integrating the layers together in different ways. Um, so combining different isotopic systems to draw out more of the meaning. And, I, and again, I'll use the analogy with geophysics where people you do joint inversions of, say, gravity and magnetics, and they get some new insight. And we could do joint inversions, for example, of, of neodymium and hafnium or neodymium and lead or something like that, or, or jointly invert or utilise isotopic layers together with the geophysical coverages that we have. And this goes to a question that was asked in one of the sessions this morning. Someone was asking about what, what, is, what is the age of some of the geophysical features that we are seeing in the magnetotelluric images, for example. And again, as we develop these isotopic data sets at similar resolution to the geophysics, we can start addressing those questions and saying, well, how old are these features that we see in the geophysics? What formed them? What, what's actually controlling the geology that, that's forming this geophysical feature? And that's just a, an exciting thing to think about. I, I, and I, in eight or ten years, I think we'll be doing that. Excellent. Thank you. What are your thoughts, Guillaume? Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, I can do it. Um, yes, I, I, I agree with um, um, uh, Jeff. Um, I think, uh, so in the space of uh, geological mapping, the integration is something that would be, uh, would be uh, good to see uh, more um, uh, happening and combining all of these data sets and seeing more um, analysis, like multivariate analysis with geophysical and geochemical data to produce some um, 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 geological maps um, or, or thematic maps um, that um, have a geological meaning, like tectonic maps or, or geodynamic maps. Um, that is something that will be interesting to see in the next eight years. Um, um, there is a lot of uh, change in that, but uh, um, yeah, that's uh, that's some, um, something uh, quite uh, that could bring a lot of outcome. Um, there is um, um, another thing I can see is obviously, and I presented a little bit uh, with a layer geology, and um, is the 3D, so moving towards like a real 3D. Um, so um, Seb will probably elaborate a little bit more, but uh, yeah, uh, now we've got this layered and at different uh, different um, um, boundaries, maybe increasing this uh, this uh, number of boundaries, uh, but really to um, um, provide the depth uh, to those units and then uh, extract the, uh, the, 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 the three dimension of those bodies um, and being able to work with um, thicknesses of um, um, and, and also volumes. I think that could be something really interesting in the next um, five to 10 years. Um, and maybe the, the last one, if I can um, add something else, is um, it would be interesting to see um, uh, maps of geological properties um, that would be quite, um, yeah, uh, will bring a lot of um, new outcome, actually, we haven't seen before. Um, so, um, yeah, that's um, my, my answer. Yeah. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so I think, you know, in, in our work area, we, we're we very um, focused on the data and the, the workflows to uh, support the, the cover modelling um, activities. So I, I would really like to see... Um, uh, like the eggs database is super handy because it everything being like really well formatted and QC'd means um, quality control. It means that we can actually take that data and make models and it, it, it really aids the reproducibility, having it accessible. So I think supporting the eggs database and, and developing that further is, is crucial. Um, you know, adding more disciplines to it, uh, adding more data to it and, you know, just slowly just building a, a, a more a national scale coverage is going to be super critical to all this work that we're talking about. Um, also the um, the workflows that we we uh, we have to uh, interpret data to collect those um, depth estimates uh, I see a great sort of scope for improvement or, and, and further development of those workflows. Um, and that's, you know, that's really going to support collecting those data sets and even, you know, working with, um, you know, state and territory geological surveys and, 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 and you know, 
um, having those collaborations with them. If we're all working, you know, to have standardised data, it's going to be super helpful. Um, and then I guess that's really leading to all these you know, these things that we're, we're talking about. Of, you know, um, the more data we, we have across the nation, the more we can, um, you know, build and refine models uh, that we can start, say, integrating with the, solar ge uh, the, the layered geology, um, you know, and that's working towards, you know, like a queryable, um, yeah, three-dimensional stratigraphic, chronostratigraphic interpretation of the Australian continent. Um, I, I'd just like to add one last thing, and I think it sort of ties all this together, and, and that's the Australian Stratigraphic Units database, which um, is is crucial for all of our work. Um, it It is sort of the foundation that we build all these um, interpretations and models on, it, all the data sets in, in the estimates of geological and um, geophysical surfaces database are uh, attributed with stratigraphic units. The, the solid geology, or sorry, the um, layer geology is uh, attributed with that um, the, those units as well. And the the work that Jeff's doing as well is um, <clears throat> uh, refining the ages of, of those units. So, you know, I'll, one thing I'd like to see in the future is um, you have further development of the Australian stratigraphic unit database. Um, so maybe even spatial attributes and and um, yeah, yeah, it's a really good point, Seb, because it, it's a database that really helps us make a link between point observations that are made on an individual sample like geochronology or geochemistry or, or even petrophysics analyses with the polygon that that sample comes from. Yeah. And so and it's, it's, it's the Australian Stratigraphic Units database that kind of provides that link between points and polygons that allows us to do so much more with with those data sets in combination. So, yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah, it has a um, category called um, um, component in um, all of the data we are collecting, basically, and that's how we can use it in maps. And, and yeah, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. That's a very insightful discussion, so thank you very much. Unfortunately, we'll have to draw uh, the Q&A session to a close now. So thank you again for your time. Thank you for answering those questions. Uh, if you would like to ask more questions or make contact with us, please email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. The showcase will continue tomorrow with the theme of National Resource Potential Assessments. The first session starts at 10.30 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time and will start on hydrogen opportunities across Australia. If you haven't registered for tomorrow's session, it's not too late. You can find the link to register for day three on the showcase webpage and on the GA website at ga.gov.au slash showcase. If you missed anything from today's session or if you would like to rewatch something, the recordings are also now available on the showcase webpage. Well, thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session today and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.